Genesis, and uh, there, chapter 28. Uh, Angie did request a copy of my poem from last week, and so I made up a couple. And uh, anytime I'm writing something like that, if you would like a copy, let me know about it. I used to, when I made them up, make up a dozen or so copies because people were always wanting them, but I, I don't write too much poetry anymore. There's not much future in it, but I found out no one's ever been rich by writing poetry. <laughs> I kind of lost interest in it. Uh, but uh, okay. I do write periodically, but uh, any time, you, let, let me know about it. But I want to read today from Genesis once again, chapter 28. And again, this is finishing up the message that we began last week. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillar and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee. And I will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into the land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken of thee to thee. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took a stone of that uh, place and uh, that it, he had put for his pillows and he set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it and he called the name of the place Bethel but the name of the city was called Luz at first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto uh, thee. Now, I spoke for about 40, 45 minutes uh, on this portion of scripture last week. And I did uh, record the sermon. I posted it both on YouTube and on Facebook if you wanted to uh, hear that, uh, see it, or refer to someone else. And uh, today we'll just conclude our thoughts on this, but at this time we find that uh, Jacob, the son of Isaac and Rebekah, was sent by them on a journey. Does anyone remember what kind of a journey this was going to be? Mm -hmm. It way. was a journey for... Wow. Romance. He was looking uh, for a wife. And they had sent him uh, back to the city of Haran. Does anybody remember why that he was going back to Haran? What was Haran? He's in this place. Well, Haran was a place that Rebekah had come from, and it was the area where Abraham had also come out of. It was an area where there was idolatry, and there were moon worshippers over there. Uh, but this is where the family was at, and uh, primarily they sent him back there because Esau, Jacob's twin brother, mm -hmm. had already taken wives, plural, but he took his wives from the Canaanites around them, and Jacob and Rebekah were grieved by him doing so. And they did not want Jacob to marry uh, the girls of Canaan, and so they were sending him back to uh, her father's house, to take a wife of them. Uh, this was a journey of about how many miles? Anybody remember how long this would be? It would have been about 450 miles. 
and uh, we didn't know exactly the way that he would be traveling, but uh, he would be making roughly about 30 miles a day, and on the uh, journey, it would have taken him about 15 days uh, to make that journey. On the second day out, he was at the city of Luz, and Luz was uh, 53 miles from Beersheba, so it would have been the second day that he would have had his dream. And uh, the Bible tells us how that uh, Jacob slept, and as he slept, uh, Jacob dreamed a dream, and in that dream, uh, the Bible says there appeared unto him a ladder, and uh, the ladder's base was on the earth, but the top went to heaven, and the angels of God were both ascending and descending upon that. And above the ladder uh, stood God the Father, and the Lord was speaking unto Jacob, and as he did, he did several things. First of all, he identified himself unto uh, Jacob, and then he began to give him uh, something that amounted to about eight wonderful, glorious promises. And he said, first of all, I will give this land unto your, you and to your seed. And he said to him, your seed will be many. He said, as the dust of the earth. Now, uh, God had called Abraham in, in Genesis 12, and there he told him also he'd make his, uh, his seed as a sand of the seashores, the stars of heaven, but here his seed would be as the dust of the earth. Uh, the Bible says they would spread to the north, to the east, to the south, and to the west, and so uh, they would fill the earth, and I think that that prophecy certainly has come true. But then he says, all families of the earth will be blessed in thee. We talked extensively about last week about the manner in which the Jewish people had been such a blessing uh, to mankind in so many ways, but especially in the spiritual sense, because it's through them that we have the knowledge of God, we have the Bible, we have our Savior, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and so we owe the people of Israel a tremendous uh, debt. And then God told him, not only will I bless you, but he said, I'm going to make you a blessing, and then he says, I will be with you. We talked about that again last week, how wonderful to know that God would be with him. Then he said to him, I will keep thee. And we said that meant to hedge about with thorns. And he would protect him and watch over him and guard him. And then he said, I will bring you home again. And then he gave him that wonderful promise. He said, I will never leave you. Uh, you know, the Bible tells us how that uh, God did turn away from some. Uh, for instance, King Saul uh, King Saul was an ideal young man, chosen by God to be the first king of Israel. And he had a wonderful beginning. He was born again, a new heart was given unto him. He was changed into another person. He was anointed by the prophet Samuel, and Saul began to serve as the first king of Israel. But because Saul was rebellious, because Saul was stubborn, uh, you know, some of us have those traits of being rebellious and stubborn. Well, the Bible says that that stubbornness is as the sin of witchcraft. And that uh, it's like idolatry. Uh, you may think it's just a little sin, but in the eyes of God, it's very serious. And Saul was elevated in his own heart and mind. He began to believe his own press. <laughs> and he became arrogant, and he turned away from God. And the Bible says that God withdrew the Holy Spirit from him, and God forsook him just the day before he was dying. He was reaching out to God, but God had turned away from him because of his sins and would no longer hear him. But uh, God promised uh, Jacob here, he said, I'll never leave you. And folks, that's the promise we have today, uh, God's promise. He would always be with us. And although these wonderful promises were given to uh, Jacob, in a lesser sense, uh, the children of Israel would benefit from that. But we can also, as believers, and many of these promises that he would bless and watch over us and keep us can apply to our situation as well, if you know the Lord. Well, the Bible tells us eventually that this dream, like all dreams, came to an end. And when that dream came to an end, and all dreams must end, 
Jacob was fortunate enough in that he could remember his dream. Uh, sometimes we remember our dreams and sometimes we do not. There are many times we'll have a dream during the night and, and uh, we will know we had a dream, but we won't be able to remember exactly what it was. We'll be like Nebuchadnezzar. We know that it troubled us, it, it, it affected us, it upset us, but we can't know what it was. Uh, but many times we remember very vividly uh, exactly what took place. I have uh, done a little bit of a study of dreams, and one of the things I found out about dreams is that uh, the average person will dream in black and white. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but this is a scientific fact. The average person will dream in black and white. Some people dream in vivid colors. And uh, if you dream in vivid colors, uh, those who are in the know say that you are a very intelligent person, that as a rule it's very intelligent people who in, in dream in vivid colors. I don't know if Jacob's dream was in color or not, but I knew the, that he uh, uh, remembered that dream. Uh, sometimes we have dreams that trouble us, but sometimes dreams are very, very delightful. Uh, you know, I've had uh, more troublesome dreams than good dreams, and I remember many nights when I go to bed, I'll pray that God will help me to dream good things, because sometimes I, I will have a dream, and uh, I'll wake up, and I'll be so upset, I won't be able to get back to sleep. I remember uh, Dr. Jack Hiles used to talk about how every night he would pray that God would give him beautiful dreams and good dreams and so that he could journey and see new lands and everything while he was sleeping. And uh, I believe God can uh, guide your dreams and everything, but uh, sometimes dreams are delightful. Once in a while you'll have a dream that just fills your heart. And I wrote that song, Heaven to Me and Heaven on My Mind, and I had a dream. Uh, back in my past, and in that dream, I went to heaven. And in that dream, I was sitting on uh, a log or something in the middle of a beautiful pasture with green grasses and flowers, and as you would imagine, I had my guitar there, and I was playing that beautiful heavenly guitar in heavenly places, and when I woke up, I remembered that vividly, and that's always been a wonderful uh, dream to my memory. Dreams can be uh, life-changing, and dreams can have a tremendous impact upon you, and sometimes dreams are allowed of God. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was a child, Mother taught us about Jesus, and in her teaching about Jesus, she taught about the second coming. She taught us about the judgment of God, and I remember when I was a teenager, when God was beginning to deal with me, I had two dreams about the second coming of Christ. And I remember the first one, I was on the front porch of our home, and I looked to the eastern sky, and there came the Lord in the sky. I remember trying to dig under the porch and hide myself from the presence of God. I remember a second dream where I was walking down the road, and I looked off always to the east, and there again came the Lord in the clouds, and it troubled me so bad that even to this day, although that was I was a teenager, and I'm far from that, I still remember those dreams. It troubled me and it made me think. And down through the years of time, I believe that God calls me to uh, do that. Uh, sometimes dreams are just nothing more than a, a passing apparition of the night. And uh, they're like a vapor. They just disappear. And they're gone. But sometimes they're lasting. I had some people laugh at me one time. And uh, I shared with them. I was doing a mini concert in a church up in Maryland and uh, doing some of my original music. Back then I was really pushing it and trying to sell my albums and get them out there. And I was telling the people about the source of my songs. And uh, they laughed at me because I told them this. For a long time in my dreams I was dreaming about songs and, 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 and melodies and words. And uh, I'd wake up and I'd remember that was a beautiful song. And I said to Don one day, Don, if I could remember those songs and that music, I could be a millionaire uh, because it was beautiful music. Uh, but uh, one day I, I woke up and I had had a dream about a song. Now, I didn't have the whole song. It would just be a melody or maybe a few words of lyrics. 
<coughs> but I woke up, it was about 2.30 in the morning, and I remembered that melody, I remembered that song, and I went to my desk, I had a roll top desk in my bedroom, and I sat down at that desk, in about 20 minutes, I wrote my first song. It was entitled, Beyond the Mountains. Uh, in the uh, years that would follow, I wrote thousands of songs, and many of those came to me in my dreams. I remember one night, I dreamed about an old black man sitting at a piano. And that old man was playing the, 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 the liveliest little tune, and uh, he was playing it and singing it. I don't remember what the words he was, but I remember the tune. And when I, I woke up, I remember that, and I sat down and I wrote the song I later recorded called, I See the Chariot. I see the chariot, oh Lord, it's come for me. And uh, we recorded that thing and did an album. And that song was recorded by other artists. Uh, Tony Morello Walker down in uh, Florida, uh, Coral Gables, Florida, I think it was. She recorded that on an album, and I recorded it. Uh, but I was telling this church, I said, uh, many of these songs come to me in my dreams. And, and, and I wake up and... And for years, I would get up in the middle of the night and, and write these songs just over and over and over. And, uh, but they thought that was so funny. But, you know, later I learned that inventors and guys who are working with problems sometimes will not be able to figure out their problem. They'll go to bed and go to sleep, and in their dream, it'll come to them how to work that out. That's a scientific fact, folks. So Pastor Madrin wasn't cra crazy and insane. Uh, I don't get too many songs in my dreams anymore, and I don't really try to write too many songs because I've written so many. But I do still uh, write songs. I wrote a new song this past week, recorded it, and put it on YouTube. I think I wrote two uh, last week, but I, I don't record them and do all that. It costs money, money, money to do that. But dreams can be life-changing, and uh, folks, this dream was going to have a tremendous change in the life of uh, Jacob. And uh, folk, he would never, ever uh, be the same man. Now, he remembered the dream vividly. He understood the significance of this, that God Almighty was speaking to him, that God Almighty had a message for him. You know, sometimes we feel so insignificant. Uh, you know, somebody mentions your name in a public place, and... Most of the people in the room was like, who that? Never heard of them. <laughs> and I remember one day I went to a radio station, and, and they were telling the guy, this guy has a, an album. We want you to play at the radio station. Who's he? I never heard of him. It makes you feel real humble when folk do that. But, you know, to think that the God of heaven knows exactly who you are, where you are, what you are, everything about you is a very sobering thought. He revealed himself unto him as a guide of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I've got a message for you. And then he faced him with a tremendous challenge. And uh, folk, Jacob understood that challenge. And Jacob was literally turned into another uh, man that night. Later, uh, God would change his name. Now, I understand Jacob, the word means supplanter. And that's what he was. He was a scoundrel. We shared that with you last week. But uh, once he had this encounter with God, his name would be changed, and he would no longer be called Jacob. He would be called Israel. And so, folk, he was greatly blessed. Now, it's evident here that the fear of God fell upon him there. Uh, the Bible says our God is consuming fire. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. And I'm thankful uh, for my past. There are a lot of things about my past that I grieved over, but one of the things I'm very thankful for is that my mother taught us the fear of God. And she taught us to respect the things of God. She taught us to respect Christians. She taught us to respect the Bible and pastors and preachers and churches. And uh, I didn't want to affiliate myself with those things back then, uh, but I had great respect for them, and I wouldn't mock them, and I wouldn't do anything wrong against them because I feared God. There's no fear of God among most people today. 
They use his name as a byword and a curse word. You know, the name of God is holy. Amen. And the first commandment says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And yet people blackguard his name and use his name as a byword and a curse word. And many even who do not do it uh, tolerate it around them. Uh, but folk, uh, they have not the fear of God. You talk to many people today, and uh, they want nothing to do with God. They'll mock you. They'll make ridicule of you. I've made a life of telling people about Jesus and talking to people about God. And I remember the day when you could go out on visitation, cold turkey visitation, back in the mid-60s. Go knocking on doors. That's cold turkey visitation. Talking to strangers you never met before. And you would only get response from maybe one or two people and one of them would invite you in to spend the rest of the evening and listen patiently to whatever you had to say. They'd turn the TV off, they'd sit there and listen, and we won entire families to Jesus because they did that. But the last time that I was involved in a lot of door-to-door -door visitation was down here. And I remember going out one day myself in Melpha. It was my goal to knock on every door in the town of Melpha. And Bob Blankenship and I knocked on many of them. Jerry and I knocked on a lot of them. But I went out by myself. One day, I went out and I was out there knocking on doors for an hour and a half. And I had three people come to the door. Uh, they know who you are. You could hear them inside talking. The main door would be open the screen. They wouldn't answer the door. They wouldn't come to the door. And uh, many that did would just run you off and tell you not to come back. And I found... Uh, when I came here, Donna and I came here in the early 70s, winning souls on the eastern shore was like shooting fish in a barrel because nobody was doing what we were doing. Look, I'm going to tell you something. We went out knocking on doors, and we led people to Christ. I mean, people were genuinely saved. I remember the day when giving the invitation, and groups of people would come forward to get saved and winning people to Christ and following them through with baptism and changed lives. And uh, folk, uh, but we came back, what, 40 years later? And the Eastern Shore was another place. It's not like that anymore. Uh, everybody you talk to has heard the old, old story. They're gospel hardened. Everybody knows how to be saved. Everybody knows the Roman road. And there's no fear of God. They will mock you. They will ridicule you. They will fight against you. And folk, uh, there's no fear of God. Uh, but with Jacob, there was a reverential fear. And uh, the word means, literally, to be frightened, to revere, uh, to make afraid. And uh, Jacob felt this way about God. Now, anyone with good sense is going to feel that way. God is not someone uh, to fool around with. Uh, God is awesome, and I remember Isaiah. In his day, Isaiah was one of the most righteous men of his day. He called an entire generation of people back to God and saved them uh, from uh, captivity. Uh, but when he saw the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6, he cried out, Woe's me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And there was a fear and an awe and a reverence. Uh, you may not know that yet, or people may not know that yet. I'm sure most of you here do, uh, but uh, probably all of you here do, but most today do not, especially the millennials. I'm told they have no place in their lives for God, and that's sad. But notice this, friend. The Bible says the day is coming. When every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to God. Amen. And there will be. You may not bow the knee to him here, but one day they'll bow the knee to God. And friend, you need to understand. And so Jacob awoke and he saw and remembered what had happened. And although God had spoken to him of great things, there were, was a reverential awe and a fear. And folks, sometimes... This is what has to be done. I remember years ago that I made a statement. Uh, Brother Jerry uh, Williams and I had been out and we had been visiting and we ran into a hard nut and he just rebelled against what we had to say. And, 
And I told Jerry, I said, Jerry, I said, what God needs to do is grab that rascal up by the nap of the neck and shake him over the flames of hell. And he thought, that's the most horrible thing. How can a pastor ever say <laughs> such a horrible thing about a poor sinful man? Well, I didn't mean that God would drop him, drop him in. Just show him what he was facing and put the fear of God in him. Because Amen. sometimes that's exactly what it takes. Some people have got to be brought to that place. Case in point, Saul of Tarshish. <clears throat> Saul of Tarshish was not won to the Lord by the preaching of Stephen. Saul of Tarshish was not won to the Lord by the preaching of Peter, James, or John. Saul of Tarshish was brought to the Lord when the Lord appeared unto him and smacked him down on the Damascus road and smote him with blindness to where he did not know what was going on. He fell on his face in fear like a dead man. There he came to know the Lord. And some people have got to be brought to that place. And they've got to realize the fear of God as God gets their attention. And sometimes that's exactly what it needs to do. And sometimes, folk, that will be uh, with a sickness, with a, a loss, with an illness, with the death of a loved one. And I believe that sometimes, you know, uh, this used to be a very critical point uh, for many people to think about spiritual things. And there are many people that really don't want to talk about death and think about death until it strikes near them. And this is where that many preachers would really uh, have a tremendous ministry of winning souls would be at a funeral. Uh, a loved one dies, and when a loved one has died, there's a void, there's an aching, there's a wondering, there's a mystery. And people are hurting, and they're wondering, and they're searching and when a man of God can step in and share with them that this is not the end, you can be forgiven, you can be saved, you can have eternal life, there's a heaven to gain, there's life everlasting can be yours. Uh, you know, we used to give invitations when my son, we had his funeral, uh, a big crowd, I had four preachers and singers, also we had a two hour service and it wasn't about testimonies, it was about preaching. When he gave the invitation at his funeral invitation, 14 people came forward and accepted Christ as personal Savior. Well, today, you know, it's a celebration of life. Let's just remember who they were and what they were. Oh, hallelujah, such a good time. What a good life. Well, there's nothing wrong with celebrating one's accomplishments and achievements and their victories and good life. But dear friend, if that's all you've got, you're a pauper. If all you have is the, ha the past and what has that, that's water under the bridge, good or bad, it's gone. You're not going to benefit from it. But dear friend, when you can tell somebody about Christ, you've got to understand, friend, they've got forever. You know, death is just the beginning of the next step of the progression of life. And they've moved on to eternity, but they're not talking about that. They just want to celebrate what has been. Let's celebrate. You want to celebrate? Let's celebrate heaven. Let's celebrate the millennial. Let's celebrate the new heaven and new earth. Let's celebrate the holy city. Let's celebrate reunion and a body that's glorified. There are reasons to celebrate at a funeral, but it's not merely because of what used to be or what has been. I wrote a song one time called Used to Be was a long, long time ago. And when it's water under the bridge, you soon forget it. But dear friend, uh, this place meant something special now to uh, Jacob. And uh, the meaning, Bethel, meaning simply the house of God, a court, a palace, a temple. The latter represents a stairway to heaven, a gateway to paradise, and angels were coming and going. Uh, I, I like that because this is uh, illustrating a wonderful Bible fact. Now, Billy Graham wrote a book on angels, and I've heard people preach on angels. Uh, I never have. I've talked about them some. Uh, but uh, it's an interesting study to study who angels are and what they are. And one of the things that people do not realize is as that ladder, those angels have been coming and going on that ladder for a long time because the angels interact with human beings. 
they sometimes take on the form of human beings. And Hebrews 13, 2 tells us to be careful to entertain uh, strangers because many have entertained angels unaware. And uh, so that latter represents a real uh, possibility. Well, when Jacob woke up, he had the fear of God. And, and so he's aware of what's going on. But now, the Bible says he sets himself up a pillar. Now, the pillar was simply a column, if you will, a memorial stone. Uh, this place, Bethel, was a special place to Jacob, and he wanted to remember it. Now, he knew that he was on a journey. It was about a 15-day journey. He had only been traveling two days, and so he had another 13, 14 days ahead to travel. So he was going to leave Bethel. He wasn't going to stay there. Uh, so... But he wanted to remember this place. <laughs> you know, we talked about last week that, you know, you haven't been to Bethel. I haven't been to Bethel literally, but we should have been to Bethel in a spiritual sense, a figurative sense, and uh, the place where we met God, where God appeared to us, where God spoke to us, where we came to know the Lord. And that will always be a special place. I think that if you haven't done it, you ought to write down the date that you accepted Christ, the place you accepted Christ, where you were at, what you were thinking, what you were doing, when you were baptized. Because I tell you, friend, as the years go on, uh, that is going to become dearer and more sweet to you all the time. And, uh, folk, I'm going to tell you, I can tell you, I can tell you about the time, I can take you to the place, I can tell you about the time of day when I came to know Christ on November the 30th, 1963, about 7 to 9 o'clock in the evening, and it's a special place. Well, this is what this was to Jacob. This is where, so he wanted a, a, a column, he wanted a memorial set up to where when he came back that way, which he would go away, it'd be 20 years before he came back, but he wanted to be able to find this place because it was special. And so he set up this marker and he intended one day to return, one day to teach his children and his family that this is where I came to know the Lord. So he sets the column up and then he worships God. And he pours oil upon uh, this stone. Uh, one uh, writer said that what he would do, uh, these Jews would do, they would pour wine upon it as a drink offering unto God. And then they would anoint it at with oil uh, signifying a sacrifice unto God and hallowing this spot in a very special place. And here he sought to worship God, to honor God, and here Jacob was uh, very, very uh, thankful. Now not only did he do this, but now we find that he goes on and he is making vows mm -hmm. to God. Now, folk, uh, this is a very serious thing. When you're dealing with God, you know, you, you don't want to deal with God the way people deal with men. Sometimes, you know, there used to be, I'm old enough to remember, one guy shook my hand one time, we just had a, we we're going to make a, a deal, a contract, and he shook my hand and he said to me, he said, my words my bond. I said, aren't we going to have a contract? And and writing, he said, my words, my bond. He said, son, if I tell you something, I'm going to do it. And uh, there was a day when a lot of business was done in that fashion. There are some men and women of character and integrity who, if they tell you they're going to do something, you can depend on they're going to do it or they're going to tell you why they can't. But sometimes we intend to do things we can't do and you call somebody up and let them know, I, I intended to be there, but I can't. You know, that's uh, ex acceptable. But when it comes to God, you know, you want to be careful. Now, when you're blessed of God, the automatic response is, I want to give back something to Him. He's blessed me. I want to do something for Him. And we're always making vows and promises. Lord God, oh, save me, and I promise I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll do the other. Sometimes people follow through with that, but too many times they do not. And I want to show you some verses. 
Turn with me to Numbers chapter 30. And we haven't run over the books of the Bible recently, but I hope you still remember <laughs> where that's at. Romans chapter 30 and verse 2. Now I want to mark this. Numbers. Numbers. Or Romans? Numbers. 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 Yeah, <laughs> numbers 30 verse 2. Did I say Romans? Yes, yes you did. did. <laughs> You misunderstood me. Okay. <laughs> that's right. Okay, that's one. What. That's senior, one. senior, senior moment. Okay, we'll we'll bleep that out. Okay, Numbers chapter thirty verse two. Uh, you don't have to laugh. Romans only has sixteen chapters. <laughs> okay, if a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Now, folks, that ought to apply when our souls are communicating with God. And it should apply when we're dealing with our fellow man. I'll be honest with you. There's not a lot of character today. There's not a lot of integrity. And there aren't too many people that will keep their word. I remember one man saying to me one time, he was a criminal and a convict, and he was my brother. <laughs> and Jack told me, he said, Jack was a country music singer, and everybody loved Jack. He had charisma. Boy, he was a, he was a gifted character. Play all kinds of instruments, mm -hmm. sing as a Nashville star, and mm -hmm. all that stuff on television, radio, and all that. But Jack was a crook. And off from the time he was a kid. But he told me one time, he said, Bob, I'll tell anybody anything they want them to hear to get them to do what I want them to do. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people like that. They'll tell you anything to do what they want you to do. Deuteronomy, turn there to chapter 23. And Deuteronomy 23 and verse number 21 it's similar to what we just read in Numbers, and you write it down, I'll read it. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. Now, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. And there, chapter 5. Now, this is an important portion of Scripture that I think that everyone should read this and know it. And it's talking about, again, vows. Ecclesiastes 5, I'll begin to read with verse 2. And here's what it says. Be not rash with thy mouth. Let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven... And thou upon earth, therefore, let thy words be few. Be careful what you say when it comes to God. Notice what he says, verse 4. When thou vowest to vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldst not vow than that thou shouldst vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the works of thine hand? In the multitudes of dreams and many words, there are also divers vanities, but fear thou God. Now Jacob is about to make solemn holy vows unto God. And you and I, at times, may very well have done that. You may have said, you know, the pastor is absolutely right. I'm going to be a witness and a soul winner. I'm going to read my Bible through. I'm going to pray. Hey, I'm going to tithe. And you make vows. Now, Jacob made vows unto God. However, notice, his vow was contingent upon something. As a matter of fact, it was a contingent upon several things. First of all, he says, If he will indeed be with me, 
if he will truly keep me, if he will indeed provide for me, if he will clothe me, if he will bring me again to my father's house in peace. In other words, what he's saying, if God keeps his word to me, I'm going to keep my word to him. Now, what Jacob is looking for is reality in life. A witness of his faith. What's James say? Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. And so what Jacob is saying, I want to see evidence of God in my life. I want to know if this was real or just a passing apparition of the night. If God keeps his word to me, I'm going to keep my word to him. At this point, he didn't know. He's just starting out. Now, that is not unusual. Now, I'll just tell you about this. You know about it. But in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, there's an incident in the life of a man called Elisha. Hey, you scholars and PhDs and masters and fluffy heads. He was just an old plow boy. <laughs> Elijah, the great prophet of God, called him from following the oxen and the plows to follow him and be his servant. And Elisha followed him faithfully. He left everything behind, and he too became a prophet. When the day came for Elijah to leave, Elijah said to Elisha, Before I leave, I'm going to bless you. You tell me what I can do for you. And Elijah said to him, Son, he said, I want a double portion of the spirits that's on you. Mm -hmm. Elijah said, Whew! That's a hard thing to ask. Boy, where'd you come for that from? Nevertheless, if you're with me when I'm taken, you'll get it. So they went along, and all of a sudden, a chariot of fire appears with horses of fire. As a whirlwind, it swept Elijah up into heaven, and Elisha's Elijah's mantle, his coat, fell at Elisha's feet. Now earlier, Elijah, who had a real God working his heart and life, had taken that mantle and he broke the brook, and the waters parted a hither and a thither. And that mantle had fallen to his feet. So Elisha picks up that mantle, walks over to the brook, and smites that brook and says, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? You know what happened? Mm -hmm. The waters parted a hither and a thither. And you know what Elijah <coughs> did? He went on to do twice as many miracles as the master. Oh yeah, an old plow boy. You'd be amazed what those simple old plow boys can do, boys and girls. You don't have to have a PhD. I'm thinking right now of a man who had a PhD. And he was listening to an old plow boy who didn't even have anything but an eighth grade education. His name happened to be D.L. Moody, and he built the great Moody Church and the college and all of that. He shook two continents with his hand, forgot. But he was on a street corner up on a little soapbox, and he was a preaching, and people got saved all over the place. And he stepped down from the soapbox, and the Ph.D. said to him, Mr. Moody, just think what you could do if you had an education. <laughs> and he said, well, I don't. You do. You get up here and show me how to do it. <laughs> You'd be amazed how little the PhDs and masters...